So I'll welcome you all. Um, thank you for joining me today in my session. I know I'm up against some stiff competition in the other rooms. because uh, I, I think there's some good talks going on. So I'm glad you guys chose to come over here and hang out with me. Uh, my name is Calvin Hendricks Parker, and I am CTO and co-founder of Six Feet Up, which is a Python and cloud consulting company based in Indiana, as some of you have already looked up. Uh, but my history with BSD and mostly FreeBSD goes way back, as I was mentioning earlier. I started using FreeBSD back in version 216, which was 1996 for those that are counting. And then I founded a company in 1999, uh, back in the FreeBSD 3 a days, uh, if you all remember that kind of history. Uh, and so we've been doing 20 years of uh, FreeBSD work uh, professionally. We have, we have many previous, you know, a couple hundred, few hundred FreeBSD boxes deployed you know, in our infrastructure. And we manage most all of our, actually 100% of them using salt stack. So today I'm going to talk about how we, uh, you know, basically I call this the dream of Python automation, but it's also my dream of BSD automation because it actually worked really well for us uh, in FreeBSD. I say I'm kind of a quietly opinionated BSD user, but no more. Um, I found that I probably should express my opinions a little more vocally about BSD and why I think it's actually great. And you'll see why at the end of this talk, because it, it kind of burnt us. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss some stories about what we went through. But I've always tried to kind of suppress my opinions for fear of like, you know, pushing my agenda onto others. But I think I will start pushing my agenda onto others a little more, because FreeBSD and BSD in general is definitely worth uh, doing that. Uh, so a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we are going to go through a couple stories about uh, some automation, uh, taking some things from the data server closet into the cloud. So there'll be quite a bit of talk about automation around, uh, you know, for our case, AWS cloud. But this is all pretty much valid for if you're doing automation in private cloud or any other public cloud. Even though I'm talking about AWS, a lot of the tooling works cross-platform, which is nice, which is why I chose some of these tools. Um, also, in Pythonista, I have been using Python since the year 2000. So if you guys got Python questions, I love those as well. <clears throat> we'll talk mostly about BSD and automation here in this talk. Now, there are some things in life that you would like to be handcrafted. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you know, fine woodworking should be handcrafted, very artisanal type things. Jewelry should be handcrafted. And my personal favorite is that beverages should be handcrafted. So fine cocktails, the, the, the more handcrafted, the better that they are. Uh, but you know, bigger infrastructure probably does not fall into this uh, this category of things that should be handcrafted. You know, the age of handcrafted servers should be long over. You know, the term bespoke should be reserved for fine clothing and not our servers or how we deploy our applications to our servers. So, tidbit of trivia, uh, the chances of a snowflake being exactly like another is one in one million trillion. So that's one followed by 18 zeros. Uh, so, Beautiful snowflakes are not reproducible, generally speaking. Uh, and the same thing happens with your servers. If you actually handcraft, how many people have handcrafted a server and never been able to get the same application to run exactly the same way on another server? I, I, I've never had that fail where I've gone into a room. And there have definitely been cases in our life, our, our company's life, where, well, the thing magically worked, and we set it up five years ago, and the customer's like, well, we need to upgrade, move data center, change something around. And we can now not get the same application to run again like it did. Uh, we basically have to figure out a way of lifting and shifting this ancient thing from one place to another to keep this one specific application running. We want to eliminate that from your lives, and I, I want to eliminate it from my life because it really turns into a, a, a major headache, right? Uh, things you can't, you can't maintain and you can't keep up to date. Uh, you also can't patch. We were talking about security uh, earlier, the fact that they released a Windows XP patch says a lot about uh, security. <clears throat> now, we love our pets, right? We give our pets cuddly names. You guys have all heard this like uh, pets versus cattle analogy for uh, servers. So it's actually coined by uh, Randy Bias after hearing a talk from Bill Baker on scaling SQL servers. You want to not name your servers with cute names because then they matter to you and you care about them when they get sick. You know, if they happen to pass, you'll be very, very sad. And there'll be lots of sad users, obviously, if the, these things happen to these very cuddly servers. You know, we want to actually have our servers be more like cattle. If part of the herd gets sick, you know, you can, you can push them off to the side, 
and basically spin up new cattle in their place. Uh, sorry if anybody's vegan in the room, uh, but it does make for a nice metaphor when talking about you know, server you know, clusters or our infrastructure. And we're now in this world of DevOps. And many non-cloud cloud native applications actually have the ability to be deployed in with cloud native tools. So you can actually take what were you know, these beautifully handcrafted things that kind of sat in a single server and actually take advantage of various cloud technologies, you know, AWS building blocks, to build up a more cloud native version of our application, which actually makes it easier for us to repeat. So how do we take these beautiful handcrafted bare metal servers running our application and translate that into the cloud? That's what I want to go over today with you guys. So real quick, uh, I hope you guys have all seen Fight Club. Do you know it's like 20 years old now? It's not depressing. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so a little bit of credit to some of her news post. My slides will have some links to where I kind of found a kind of good start on these things. Is that uh, so the first rule of Fight Club, obviously, is you don't talk about Fight Club. I kind of changed these around to be a little more uh, DevOps based for us. So the first rule of DevOps Club is you do not log into your servers. Second rule of DevOps Club, you do not log into your servers. And, and why do we do this, right? In, any chance you have to kind of turn that thing into a beautiful snowflake, most system admins probably will take advantage of that and do it. And they shouldn't. And that, that temptation to log in and just quickly fix that one little thing really needs to be uh, you know, dealt with you know, at the top, top level from your, like your DevOps or operational management leadership is that we don't want to encourage people to log into the servers because that does cause the proliferation of these unique snowflakes. Uh, our second rule of Dev, our third rule of DevOps Club, if the deployment fails, roll back. So if you cannot accomplish this rule, you need to start putting in place processes that will allow you then to be able to roll back. Making sure you've got a version control system, some kind of continuous integration uh, building, whether you're building pristine like, images of your application or you have a way of getting back to a previous state, you always need to make sure you have a way back because that allows you to, to move forward faster. If you have a, 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 a comfort zone or a, a comfort with being able to move quickly forward, knowing that you can get back uh, easily, that great gives co a confidence level to your deployments that you don't have from before. Uh, if you know this is the only way forward and there's no way back, that's kind of like burning all the ships, right, when you come to the new world, that can be really rough if something goes wrong. Uh, but if you know you got a way back, it makes doing DevOps and automation a heck of a lot easier because you feel a lot more comfortable with it. Uh, fourth rule, all artifacts are stored in source control. So this helps with the third rule. Uh, make sure that all artifacts are stored in source control, not only for the rollback, but also for auditing. If you want to do code review, we're moving into more of a world where management of our infrastructure looks like development. Uh, we can do the same things that developers do. We can do code review. We have full source control. We expect good commit messages. We want to understand what has happened to our infrastructure over time. And the only way we can do that is if we have source control in place. Our fifth rule, only one deployment at a time. We are still humans, and our brains can typically handle kind of one task at a time. Even though we think we can multitask, we're pretty terrible at it, just as a species. So if we can maintain one deployment happens at a time, that keeps us focused on making less human errors. Because let's all be honest, right? The computers don't make the errors. The computers just do what we tell them to do. So if we're making the errors, the computers will help, and actually DevOps will help propagate it even faster. Uh, so errors can move a lot faster in a DevOps world. Six rule, actually one of my favorite ones, and one we'll talk about specifically with FreeBSD. No one-offs and no special cases. Uh, if you start making those special little edge cases, the complexity of the whole system to manage as a whole becomes much more difficult to deal with. Uh, it's just kind of common sense, but I think a lot of people see the easy way forward is, oh, if I just happen to add in this third-party package repo from some random site I found on Google, it'll make it all better right now. But it will not make it all better later when that site becomes bit rotted and no one's maintaining it, or if it becomes compromised, and now people are putting code into those packages that you, you just randomly are trusting. So with the case of no, no one off the special cases, we try and find ways to you know, take that natural path forward with our infrastructure and use the tools that are available to us kind of in the way they are intended to be used. And as soon as we start bending that too much one way or another, we've got to find either another way to do it or find a way that works better with that natural path. 
the seventh rule, deployments will go on as long as they have to. So much like the fights will go on as long as they have to, our deployments will go on as long as they have to so we can get things done and get things moving forward. So if the deployment uh, is cut short and left in an unknown state, we better be able to exercise rule number three, which is to be able to roll back. And the eighth rule of and final rule of DevOps Club, if this is your first night at DevOps Club, you have to push the prod. Uh, there are a lot of organizations who are taking this mentality, especially on the development side, that we want to get frequent and, and often changes to production. And a lot of times they'll bring in new developers, and because they do have a comfort level and a confidence level in the processes in place, and we know we can roll back, they encourage new developers to make changes on day one of their employment that get pushed to broad. And I think the same thing should be held true for infrastructure people. If we're doing DevOps correctly, those should be low risk. Uh, they should be caught quickly either by continuous integration and unit testing, and we should have the ability to roll back. Uh, but I think it gives the new, new person on the job a confidence level that they can build and make things happen. And even if they break something, there's a, an easy way back. Oh, please ask me questions all along the way. Um, this can be as, as interactive as you want. You've been influenced by agile. It doesn't seem to be exactly agile, but I see a lot of. Yes, but we we have so for him, our company six feet up. We don't specifically do Scrum or any of the specific agile methodologies. But waterfall doesn't fit this model well at all. I mean, we really have this iterative cycle of keeping things moving forward as. as not as fast as possible, but as, as swiftly as possible. I think accelerating the velocity and changes into the infrastructure gives our end users more features faster. It also makes sure that the changes are smaller. So if the change set is, is very, very small, it's much easier to roll back. If you have these giant monolithic change sets to either infrastructure or the software, that rollback process becomes you know almost exponentially as it's complex to be able to roll back out if you have, happen to have a failed release. So a lot of the ways these things happen is by keeping changes small and keeping them frequent and keeping them rolling forward. Yeah. Uh, what do you think how far is the, the time when DevOps will not be able to anything on a server? Uh, I think that's now for us. Uh, our goal is that these are for these these are building blocks. I, and I'll show you, we've taken these non-cloud native applications. So I think a lot of people may run legacy apps where it tended to have a lot of manipulation of the systems to get these apps running. I think there is ways with, for example, tools like SaltStack, you know, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, that allow you to do the, all that configuration from a, like, I want to configure it locally on my own machine. I want to be able to test that configuration. So of actually having continuous integration where I can run it through an automated test process, and then the release process is fully hands off. Like we want to as push button as possible, and new releases of the software will follow along that same line as well. And so I think even for us, we're a small company, we're like 20 people, and we're able to do this. I understand maybe the enterprise feels like it's that giant you know, aircraft carrier that turns really, really slowly. And I think that because these changes can be small, and you can start implementing these these kinds of methodologies in a small fashion, you can sneak them in and start doing it today. At least that's my opinion on this. I, I, There's a suggestion that they won't hear the questions there. You should repeat them. Oh, I should repeat the question. Yeah, so the question we were just answering was, you know, what, do, how long until you think we'll get into a point where we won't SSH into servers and we'll deploy without any interaction? And I, I, think we're, I think we're there today. I think a lot of organizations better be thinking about moving that direction. I mean, if you guys are familiar with the Amazon Web Services Cloud, which probably most of us are, you know that they have how many three, you know, three-letter acronyms, TLAs, uh, of services available. Those are all you know, basically virtual machines running on some hardware someplace, but they've configured them to be quickly deployable as a service. And I think our EC2 instances that run our application should be thought of in the same process. Like, it should be nearly point and click to deploy our web application into an EC2 instance, or to scale, like auto scale it across a load balancer, you know, leveraging those other backend pieces that Amazon gives you for the serialization and storage of the data layer. You know, our things can be re replaceable. Uh, the application code runs basically in almost a stateless container. And actually, there's another take on this welcoming DevOps club, and it, you guys know the movie Fight Club. There's actually a welcoming take on DevOps Club 
uh, from a blog post that's linked into from my slides as well. And those will be up um, whenever Dan releases the next version of the BSD CAN site. He'll publish these slides. So we're talking about DevOps Club, and when we enter this world, we need to talk about tools. And for us, we use Python. Luckily, the Amazon Web Services platform is like Python first almost. They, they developed and actually released the Bado free library for doing dealing with the APIs. And the other part we use is Salt Stack. I'm actually wearing an OG, like an old school Salt Stack shirt today in honor of uh, the talk. But that's also written in Python, so it kind of fits well with our Python and cloud consulting mindset. But I think it's easy to use for a lot of people who even touch Python or have never touched Python because most of the time you're actually editing YAML. Uh, which is a very human-friendly, readable data format that you can you know, type out in plain text to set the states of things. And I'll, I'll show some examples of what that looks like as we go along through the slides. So the, the use case I want to talk about first is taking that single, you know, little, this was literally a server in a closet. Uh, we went from the closet to the cloud uh, with this customer. It is the uh, University of Notre Dame had their engineering website I think it was literally within some closet in some building on campus, uh, which is probably not uncommon for these kinds of groups. But they had a mandate to move everything into the cloud. And so given that mandate, we thought this was an excellent opportunity to automate the release process of this so that it could require less technical expertise to actually be able to release their software. Uh, with this current stack of software, uh, there's obviously the, the web proxies like Nginx and Varnish and HA proxy. In this case, it's a content managed, like it's a public facing website. If you go to engineering.nd.edu, you'll land on this site, not running here anymore, but in the new infrastructure. It's running a content management system called Clone, which has multiple instances, and then it had a single like, back end storage layer where all the data actually lived. We wanted to be able to deploy this in a cloud native way so that if one server went down, we didn't care. We could actually spin up you know, any number of servers into a, a load balancer and have it take care of the load, or if they, for example, had a dignitary visiting the campus, we wanted to be able to handle additional capacity and have that kind of elasticness that's been the promise of Amazon Web Services. Well, the promise of Amazon Web Services is there. You can do it, but you have to tell it to do it. They don't just do it for you. There's nothing automatic about uh, being in the cloud. It still is literally just other people's servers. Luckily, they give you nice APIs to be able to interact and perform these things in an automated fashion if you use the right tools. So we want to take this you know, server in a cloud, or server in a closet, up into the cloud. You know, so again, going from the closet to the cloud. Uh, this is, again, a nice opportunity to take this aging simple server and improve their performance and resilience. So give them some high availability um, aspects that we are going to be in a public cloud and have access to resources easily. We don't have to wait you know, a month for a server to be provisioned and, and deployed into their closet. We can actually grab those resources as need, needed. But how do we make it repeatable? Like, so, for example, you could go into the Amazon Web Services console, you can click around to your heart's content, but this is nearly as, as evil as logging into your servers over SSH and configuring things by hand. Uh, you'll never get it the same way twice. In our case, we wanted to be able to leverage those cloud native technologies, for example, CloudFront for CDN. So now instead of having a single, like a Varnish server serving up cache from a single point on the uh, planet, we can now take advantage of the 145 points of presence that the CloudFront CDN gives us. We want to be able to use a load balancer that can allow us to dynamically add new instances in and out of that load balancer, so using the Elastic Load Balancer service. The AV1 and AV2 boxes here are two EC2 instances, one in each availability zone. So inside of Amazon regions, you have availability zones, which are different data centers separated by some you know, minimum amount of distance. But that gives us that high availability in case one data center goes offline for some, some reason, someone digs a hole, cuts a line, whatever the case may be. Those uh, EC2 instances, those are the only like virtual machines on here that like are you could SSH into. All the other services here are managed by the Amazon Web Services Cloud. But those two uh, web or servers that are on here contain no data we care about. None of the data for the site or the storage of the files happens in that layer. This allows us then to make them more like cattle. They can be taken out offline. Other servers can come up and re replace them in, inside this uh, infrastructure. We do put the data, though, into some other Amazon components, like EFS, which is their hosted NFS service, and then RDS, which is their hosted database service. 
So that gives us the ability to store our data into places where we can bring our servers on and offline quickly, uh, build a brand new image, deploy those images out of these EC2s for this, and have them connected to our existing data stores, and they're online in, in you know, could be seconds. I mean, really, they, they can spin up very, very fast. And then everything gets backed up into S3 for the durability factor of having a resilient backup. You could point and click your way through this, uh, but it would be tricky, especially when you start getting into the VPCs and the networking and the private subnets and the public subnets and all the other you know, pieces that are involved here. So into the automation. Uh, obviously, we need to be able to have a way to point and click and have a repeatable way for us to put those pieces into place. So we'll kind of start at the network, because that probably is one of the trickiest bits of Amazon to figure out. They give you a default VPC when you log into your first Amazon account. It's generally useful to kind of try some things out, kind of prove a concept type stuff, but it's not really recommended for production. You're going to want to set up uh, different VPCs for different purposes. In our case, we want to be able to have this thing be a push button that it actually, the, the automation will deploy out the full network stack for any environment we want. So if we have a production environment, we want to be able to build a test environment that matches it at a moment's notice, or we want to build another test environment beside it so we can do performance testing and not impact maybe uh, a test round that's happening in a specific other environment. So and we want them all to match. You know, they can't be differences here because they go run into those strange edge cases. Something will fail in one case and not in another. But we have a way, we need a way to control this. So we set up a, basically a control v, control VPC where we put our salt master and VPNs. So that is the administration point for all the tools. But I want to go so far as to make sure that even that control VPC is set in an automated fashion. I don't want to manually configure anything through the, through the um, console or shell into a box to get this all actually bootstrapped. So this is where we start using SaltStack and Bado3. Uh, and the reason we use Bado3 is we have to have a way to bootstrap that salt master. Now I'll talk a little bit more of the, the master menu process of SaltStack, because that's actually how it runs, uses a, a control and then some kind of agent on your EC2 instances or to talk to the Amazon cloud. But we'll use Bado3 to actually get things bootstrapped. So we do have a bit of a chicken and egg problem. How do we get the salt master in place so we can build the other VPCs uh, without manually going in and clicking and creating these subnets? Luckily, the Bado3 API is very easy to use. So if you're familiar with Python, uh, it's very, you know, in the world of Python, it's Pythonic. Uh, it kind of follows the tenets of the language of Python. Uh, so actually, another recommendation for you all, if you guys have a Python prompt on your computer, is to open up Python and type import this and you'll get a nice Zen of Python, which kind of may explain why Pythonistas think the way they think. So it's a little easier for you to try out. But in you know, Python and using the Bado3 library, we can create a new uh, VPC with code. In our case, to create a whole VPC, we pass in the CIDR block of IP addresses for that VPC. Uh, we can add a tag in there for the control VPC, and we can add in some DNS um, attributes for that VPC. And that's basically all the code that's needed is to get started with that control VPC. So we wrote this into a single script, it's about you know, less than 100 lines long, that bootstraps that, that VPC for us. Uh, what's also nice about SaltStack is it does have public cloud and private cloud support, so we can talk to AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, or if you're running VMware on uh, internal infrastructure, you can talk to VMware and do similar things. This is not limited to only AWS work. You can actually use it in, in your own infrastructures as well. Oh, and so to do all this, you have to have credentials. Like you have to have your API keys, your secret key, and your you know, there's two bits, big secret bits of information you need to use. And as a uh, service to you all, I want to make sure that you you all don't end up as a next headline on Hacker News someplace for exposing your API keys. Uh, make sure you have some mechanism for storing your keys securely. Uh, on my laptop, I have no keys written onto the file system that are not encrypted in some manner. And typically, I don't actually keep them on my laptop anyway. I use another tool like, for example, we use LastPass for password management. Well, we were using LastPass. Literally this week, we were switching over using 1Password. What's nice about those tools is they do have command line integrations, typically. So LastPass has a, a LastPass command line um, tool that has someone who wrote a wrapper script for it called LPassM. 
that allowed me to basically grab the environment variables out of my last patch store and put them into my environment just for that session. As soon as I closed that shell, you know, they were only ever in my memory. Uh, they are no longer, they're not written anywhere on my computer. Uh, one path with a similar feature is an OP command line tool. You can get a specific uh, item out of your, lap, your one password vault. Grab, for example, that one uses properties. So I basically set properties for the key and secret, and then I export them directly into my environment whenever I start running these tools and start working on that project. Uh, if you want a little more sophisticated version of these kinds of things, you may want to look into tools like HashiCorp Vault, where you can start storing, have a, a, an infrastructure for storing your secrets. But please, please, please don't do what the documentation says for the AWS CLI, where they tell you to put it into like a dot file on your home directory. Yeah, it's, it's sure it's easy to get going. It's also very easy to get hacked. Uh, anyone who has access to your computer could possibly pick up those credentials and start using your API keys. And spending a lot of money very quickly if they want, if they really knew what they were doing, or if they didn't know what they were doing. But in this case, yeah, this environment grabbed in the active key and the secret key, or secret active key, and the key ID. What's also nice with the environment variables with the bottom three library is you can specify other kinds of configurations. So there are typically like other configurations like the region. Uh, you can also specify specific profiles. There are other many other kinds of settings you can set via the environment variables. If you store those all in the vault right next to the keys, importing them is trivial because you have I basically have a one liner that gets my environment activated and ready to use with whatever project I'm working on. So from here, we initialize the network. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read all that code. Uh, we initialize the, the initial VPC, and we will spin up an EC2 instance into that um, VPC, our control VPC, for our salt master. And in our case, uh, we have a bootstrap SH that we will read in and put into our user data. So each EC2 instance, you can pass in a, a shell script or user init script to basically install the initial code onto our initial packages on that server. So we do everything, like including pulling out our, our Git repository of the configurations on that machine all in one script. So no humans touch the box, it starts up, installs salt, grabs the latest um, set of states for our salt configuration, and ready to go uh, without any human interaction and then write into one script. Uh, so we basically start up an instance, you pass in the uh, user data, so that's our bootstrap you know, SH script, that installs private keys, uh, sets up the repositories, and makes everything ready to go for us to now deploy the production environment or deploy the testing environment. One thing to kind of watch out for, a little kind of tip here when you're doing these kinds of things, the cloud infrastructure is not like instantaneous. You may run some of these commands and they may return instantly, but the infrastructure may not be there for you to use yet. So in our case, if you want to do something like add a tag to that instance, that may work, but if you want to actually interact with the instance, it may not be there just because of the asynchronous nature of the, of the um, of spinning up resources of the cloud. A, a specific example of this is if you want to associate an elastic IP directly to the EC2 instance, you cannot do that until the instance is actually in a running state. Now, EC2's API on Bado does have some processes for dealing with this, or you can just, the simple way is put in some sleeps in your code. That's kind of the poor man's way to do it. But if you want to do a more fully asynchronous, there is a waiter uh, method of the uh, Bado 3 code where you can say, wait until the instance is started, and then continue my code. So basically, it does like a polling of the API to see when your actual instance is ready to go before you move on to the next steps. Yeah? Yeah, when you keep numbering the key, bootstrap server already, how, how are you having its keys, uh, SSH key, or not SSH, but whatever identification? So in this case, for this specific problem, we, we will do these per project, and we'll have a, like a deploy key in the salt master that is shared with the team, or you could deploy in, like, SSH copy the keys into those control servers. So that those control servers are distributing, or they are logging to the control server to check for that code. They would log in the control server. You, you would log in the control server to run the, the salt command to build the other infrastructure. What we typically have is a, an SSH key shared amongst the team for that project that they would have in there on their own computer to, to log in with. And uh, let's say you have Nginx running. Do you have an autonomous process which checks if Nginx is running? Or do 
for an alert. So that'd be separate from our automations. We, we will put in place, uh, we use Zadix for a lot of our monitoring. Oh, actually, we're going to move to using Prometheus for that. But we'll hook in Prometheus to uh, Grafana or Elastic Stack for those kinds of monitoring. And you could use Cloud, depending on what cloud you're in, like using Amazon Cloud, you could use CloudWatch for those kinds of uh, notifications. So that's that's kind of a lot more, there's a lot more choices there on how you want to handle that. Especially in our environment, if we say, like, I'm connected down at the SDK and then we check what's up. Oh, so you can, you, so with salt, you can do that. Um, basically, everything happens from the master. So you will log in the master. You can do a service status from the master like across, like, your, say you have a fleet of, like, 10 internet servers that are in the front end. You can see the status of all 10 of them simultaneously because you can use what well, I'll get right to that in a moment. All right. Uh, because that, that's one of the features I like about Salt compared to some of the other tools, where it gives us the ability to do remote commands and not just configuration management. Okay. Which is what you, I think, what you're interested in. So, what is Salt Stack? This is a perfect segue. Like, I, I did not plan it, I swear. Uh, so, Salt Stack is this event driven orchestration written in Python. It is more than just configuration management. So some of the things that I like about Salt that make it different than say Public Chef or Ansible is the fact you do have remote execution. So I can log into the Salt Master and interactively query my whole environment or send commands to the whole environment or to a subset of my environment based on lots of different criteria. So you can query and select machines based on you know, value, values in certain variables or network subpaths or you know, the logs of the name, or any, you, know, you can set up different kinds of ways. And you can actually do compound um, query methods against your environment. So you can select all the web servers, or all the Nginx nodes, and say a service status. And then you can do service start, for example, across that same level of nodes, and start all 10 of them simultaneously if you wanted to. A lot of the tools don't allow for that, that level of interaction with your machines. With the remote execution, you can also populate, say, for example, databases of your machine information. So if you wanted to grab, you know, what's a CPU processor, network cards, serial numbers, you know, all the kind of identification information or any kind of metadata from the machine, you can do that as well with that remote execution. And then output it into, you know, a MySQL database, Postgres database, LDAP, and wherever you want to land that kind of data in a, you know, whatever, however your infrastructure is managed, you can do that with salt stack very, very quickly. The salt stack also has support for, like I said, the various public clouds. It also has a built-in modules for things like curl. So you can get, you can access the AWS metadata server and actually assign metadata into the machines based on metadata that's been set at kind of a higher Amazon level, like tags, or you can get data about coming from the, the metadata service that you wouldn't normally have access to just on the machine itself. So that's the remote execution. The next really nice feature about Salt is the event-driven orchestration. Since you are using typically with Salt a master and minion, like you have a, a server with agents running on all your various other servers in your infrastructure, you can use that to you know, not only query and do remote execution, but listen for events coming across the event bus. So Salt uses zero queue for um, a message transmission across all the servers, so it's very, very fast. You can actually execute things in parallel across a thousand servers and with very low overhead because of this master minion architecture. Is this UDP or? Hmm? Is this UDP? Uh, I think it's for UDP and TCP. So zero Q, I'm not 100% certain on which one it's always using, but I think you can use both. Like I know you for the firewalls, you have to open up like 4506 on UDP and TCP for it to talk. So that the minions will register in with the master at that point, they're on the message bus with the rest of the machines in the, in the architecture. You can now listen for events coming across. So there's going to be salt-specific events. Like, for example, if a new minion comes online, there'll be an event saying this new minion is available. If a minion goes offline, there'll be events likewise from the master saying I've lost track of a, of a minion. And then you can interact with it based on that. So you can now take an action based on a minion disappearing. You can also set up beacons on the machines. You can watch for activity and send special, your own custom events across that same bus. So if you, for example, are watching for someone SSHing into a server and they shouldn't be, you can actually uh, interact with it. So if someone SSHed in, that can send a custom event across the bus. You can have a re what's called a reactor on the salt side to then take action, you know, either sending a, 
a, a wall message to them or you know, some custom interaction you want, we want to have happen. You can use it for monitoring. Some people have used, like, for example, uh, Graphite uh, across the, the, this is a transport mechanism for your monitoring. Uh, so you could send Prometheus data or any other kind of data you wanted across that bus back to the master event to deal with it as events. So the event reactor may be to put it into the master database of, of uh, monitoring data. So you can run agentless, uh, but the common way you would run this is with masters and minions. It does support an SSH transport like the Ansible. If you guys are familiar with Ansible, you can do a similar transport to Ansible where it SSHs into all the machines. Obviously, you you sacrifice or give up performance in that case uh, versus being able to have this agentless operation. <clears throat> it can support cloud provisioning, so there are the cloud libraries built into it for uh, specifically spinning up cloud infrastructure. In our case, we bootstrapped an Amazon EC2 instance using the Bottom Three library to get us started. But from here on out, we're going to use SaltStack and its native cloud libraries to talk to Amazon and provision infrastructure for our projects. And then I like the fact that the speed and scalability of using zero and queue uh, it gives us that scalability across, say, thousands of servers. You can also set up um, like sub-masters. If you had, for example, wanted to have a master in each data center, they would all talk to that centralized master. They all act like a master, but they talk locally to their own sets of machines. So if you have you know, maybe geographically distributed machines, you can actually coordinate between the master and what are called syndics to be able to talk to the, the machines that are closer to physically the, the fleets of machines you'd want to actually manage and maintain. So this is similar, like I said, to some of the other tools, but I think it gives you this additional benefits over what you would get with like a Chef Puppet or, you know, for example, we can use Fabric for orchestration, but it doesn't handle a lot of configuration management. Uh, you can use Terraform for cloud provisioning, but it doesn't handle the orchestration pieces. This brings a lot of that into one nice tool. Now, I will say we are using uh, Terraform more and more for some of the infrastructure and then maintaining salt for our configuration management and orchestration pieces, that more cloud orchestration, like in real time piece. And Terraform seems to be better about keeping up with all the latest APIs. Uh, Amazon's a bit of a move that kind of sands of the desert type thing. They, it moves very quickly underneath you. And so whatever tools you use, you have to make sure they keep up with the APIs underneath uh, as, as quickly. So again, I want to reiterate, it's, it's always best when minions have their master. You know, minions are very, very sad if they don't have a master. They can work, just not as effectively or efficiently. So let's make sure we, we actually use a, a master with, with our minions. I have, I have a, a silly question. Yes. How long was your discussion about the replacing master-slave terminology? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have to be a part of that. Um, uh, that, 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 that that's been there. So we, I've been using SaltStack since version 0.10. So it's been about seven years now, I think, or so. And uh, it was rough at the beginning. I would say that things are very much more stable as far as the APIs of SaltStack itself. Uh, early, one of the things I liked about SaltStack early on was they were moving very, very fast. The, the, and they still move very fast as far as development speed but they're not doing the same kind of breaking changes that they were doing early on. Uh, I think they saw when they had a bad idea and they addressed it quickly. Unfortunately for some of us users, we just kind of had to bear it. Uh, but it, I mean, it was definitely rough, but obviously I didn't run away. I'm still here and still happy with Salt. And so it's very stable now. So they have a new numbering scheme and, and the issue tracker is very active. As far as an open source project goes, uh, I find them to be a very good model of a corporation or a company running an open source project it is not an open core type project. If you guys are familiar with open source licensing and how some people license out their tools, their salt stack server is the exact same salt stack you use if you have their enterprise product. The only thing the enterprise product adds on top of that is going to be a UI that kind of has ACLs and automation pieces that are more point and click for the enterprise. Uh, but the underlying salt stack salt server you run is exactly the same one as is what's included with the enterprise version. You're not running a version behind or a beta version or some of that open core software does this to get you to buy their thing. Uh, SaltStack doesn't seem to do that. They, they seem to they play really nicely. The issue tracker people respond very quickly. So if you do have issues, I highly recommend going to GitHub, putting in issues. Uh, they take pull requests. I, 
I contributed that pull request for FreeBSD support into Bootstrap script, and it got merged in 15 minutes. Uh, I don't think they do it that fast anymore, because that was back in the old days when things were moving fast and quick, but uh, I, I would say they do watch that very, very closely. Now, when we orchestrate our servers, for example, if we want to run a deployment to a specific environment and build out those VPCs, every aspect of our infrastructure is going to be defined by what Salt calls uh, pillars and states. So you can think of the states as uh, like classes or kind of a, that uh, skeleton structure of how a service would run. And the pillars are the data which you know, filter in to fill in the variables. So you, you can reuse those states across multiple projects or multiple clients. You, you, may, you may refactor it into what's called a formula. For example, like if, you wanna, if you always want to deploy Postgres and you have a standard way that if your company always deploys Postgres, you would use that across multiple projects, but the pillar data would be what's different, like database names, uh, the HBA, like authentication bits, the passwords, users. That would all be in pillar data. And pillar data is secure, well, secured by um, the gloss. So for example, if I have only the database servers in production have access to the production pillar data, the staging database servers do not, or the dev database servers do not have access to that data. So they cannot. You know, your developers, for example, would not have authority or access to the production uh, database passwords if you're, using, if you're using the pillar data correctly, which is how we do it. In our case, we actually want to be able to, to use that same set of orchestrations across multiple environments. So in, our, in the first uh, instance here, we're running an orchestration to build the VPCs, the private subnets, all the NAT gateways, internet gateways, elastic IPs, all the stuff that basically gets pushed into uh, Amazon VPC is done in this deploy environment. And we pass in which environment we're, we're going to build out. So if we want to build five more test environments, you just we would build pillar data for those other environments. Because you may have different IP, like cited blocks that would be different, so you don't overlap across uh, two VPCs with the same uh, IP blocks. You would just basically set that up in your pillar, pillar data for that environment run this exact same command to get that different data, and now you're going to put a fresh environment that's, that's exactly matching the previous environment that's deployed before. So no more unique snowflakes, and we actually have a repeatable way of deploying multiple environments. So this is running with our masters and minions. They're very happy. So now, without humans, we're able to deploy all this. The control infrastructure is up. That orchestration we just looked at deploy these two VPCs with the private and public subnets. And then inside of each of those subnets, we get the various infrastructure pieces now built out. So we have defined inside of our salt stack infrastructure what size EC2 instances, what images to deploy. Um, it even goes so far as to also provision the EFS, which is the NFS storage, the RDS, which sets up the database backend. It instantiates the database user, uh, sets the passwords. The uh, code gets deployed via salt stack as well. So as, as part of this whole orchestration, <clears throat> the salt stack will pull out the code from GitHub or whoever you know, Git backend we're using. It will use the same pillar data. So the pillar data is a canonical source of authentication information or uh, custom variables for that environment. It will actually set into the code the database passwords for us. So the Again, the practice is not to store our database passwords anywhere that is not you know, easily accessible. So none of our code repositories for the developers contain any passwords for any environments. And that's all coming from Salt. So when it gets deployed in an environment, Salt handles that for us automatically by putting the passwords into the code for, for the right places for the connection strings for us. And so no, it, all of this gets deployed as, as one, in one go from one, one deploy environment command. Now it may take a few minutes on the first run, but then subsequent runs, so for example, if you wanted to add in additional servers, maybe you wanted to expand this load balancer to include you know, two more servers, you would run the exact same command. It would ensure that those two extra servers are brought online, put into the load balancer, uh, hooked up with the right passwords, deployed the right code, all behind the scenes without having to redo all of this. It would, it would basically ensure that the environment is in a, a state you have defined for it. So now, you know, I talked a little bit about code deployment. When you go to deploy code, you typically don't want to deploy the whole infrastructure every time. So this is where salt comes into play with this orchestration. So we've used it for configuration management, and we use it to orchestrate building the infrastructure. 
We can also now use it to orchestrate releasing code to the servers. We have a customer, it's the Central New Mexico Community College, and they run a VMware cloud internally, and we use SaltStack in their infrastructure to do this exact type of task. The main reason we do this is because as we start deploying across more and more servers, uh, things get, can get tricky, right? It can get more complicated to deploy. Developers, the people who are doing the code, don't have time to kind of understand a lot of that infrastructure. So being able to deploy and use kind of this point-and-click infrastructure or point-and-click deploy of code has become a big win for them. <coughs> so in our case, we, we can schedule or make, we can schedule uh, or have, allow the developers to do like zero downtime releases by orchestrating every piece of the release for them. So in this case, uh, we loop over every app server. So the, the orchestrations are just Jinja templates of YAML. So if you understand Jinja or use Jinja templating, you've got all the loops and helpers and everything available to you. So we dynamically determine what the app servers are and then loop over with each in turn deploying code. Now what we do is we'll, for example, stop the Varnish server, which takes it out of load balancer. We've actually switched this up now to use HA proxy and an API to talk to HA proxy to take the machines out of load balancer, perform the release, uh, make sure the instances are back live again before we put them back into the load balancer. So we can actually do this, you know, basically step through the whole environment, making sure the servers are back online before we put them back in load balancer. And then for the developer, they just run one command and then kind of wait for the output. If there's, any, if there's any errors along the way, salt stuff will stop and not proceed to thrash the rest of your environment. It'll basically stop you at a point where the machine's no longer in the load balancer, but something may be broken. The site's still alive because the other instances that are part of the cluster are still handling the, the site. Uh, so in this case, you know, we run uh, the control of the instances to stop them. We may roll up, uh, roll out specific code. In our case, we may have the dev branch our default code, but if you release for production, you can specify that as part of the orchestration. So this also allows them to roll back. They can pass in a variable for which like uh, git tag or git revision they want, and it'll release that specific code out to the servers for them. They've never had to log into any of the application servers. They're doing this all from the salt master. And then release tasks. So if the release is more than just put code on a place and restart a server, you may have to do things like run uh, grunt or gulp, like to do some kind of pre-compilation of like CSS and JavaScript. Those kinds of tasks all now happen as part of the salt salt orchestration. This is all part of one big like orchestration file. You know, this is the gulp bits here. So they actually run gulp and then install if there's new components that came in as part of the theme or the front end of the website. Those all get handled automatically because humans will typically forget to do this on release and then you end up with a broken site and no one's happy. And it's not just releases. We actually use the same technology or orchestrations to do things like bringing production data from production back to the dev environment because it involves typically not only dumping the databases but then on dev, dropping them, and then grabbing, for example, the blob database or blob storage. Like the, the site, the technology we use splits the large data files into a, like a hash directory structure. And we need to be able to synchronize that back to the dev environment in sync with the database at the same time. Again, humans are not good at this thing. Computers are very good at it. And now the developers who are non-technical about command line can basically run one command and get their, their data on the dev environment refreshed from production. Uh, we also use it for scheduling database backups. So we nightly will have it run during a maintenance window, uh, switching and knowing which machine is like currently the slave. So we run a Postgres cluster with a master and a slave. And we only ever want to run our database backups against the slave. So it's, it's in read-only mode. Well, how do you know which one is the slave? Salt so actually gives us the ability to query the machines with the remote execution, determine which machine is actually running a slave, and then only run the database backups on the slave machine. So it doesn't matter if, if they had failed over sometime during the day, it doesn't matter which one's master or slave. The, the scripts, the salt orchestration is figured out for us. Um, oh, I'm kind of running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to keep you any longer, but there are some more stuff in my slides about uh, using Cloud Custodian for management of uh, hours. For example, running dev VMs only during business hours and have them turn on and off automatically using a tool called Cloud Custodian. It's also written in Python. It also uses the Vado 3 API on the back end. Uh, it's also nice for doing compliance issues. So if people are writing uh, S3 uh, buckets with keys that are unencrypted, you can actually self-heal that type of activity because it runs on AWS Lambda, listening for CloudTrail events such as like new keys or EC2 instances being spun up, maybe with old AMIs. 
you can then have multi-step work alert the user group, spun it up, and then shut it down if they don't re react within a certain number of days. And they're getting grabbing trucks and grabbing production data, they can skip over that. Uh, sound tuning, that was not definitely a, as easy as I make it all sound. Uh, the special cases thing, this is where FreeBSD comes into play. Uh, the zip Python specifies there should be one and preferably one way to do something, but it may not be obvious unless you're Dutch. Uh, this is where the non-obvious part came into play. We did not want to have special cases for uh, installing certain kinds of packages on the machines for the dependencies of the application itself. So for example, uh, WV or HA proxy, we needed specific new versions of those tools. Uh, so I was like, well, great, we'll use Amazon Linux, because that's like the native Linux for running AWS. Their package repositories are old. Sad. Uh, we were practicing CentOS 7, because it'll be newer. Not new enough. Uh, and for, well, fortunately for us, FreeBSD's package system is awesome and actually allowed us to run with just the standard package repositories and get the versions of the tools we needed to run our place. Uh, it, was, it was painful, and we spent probably two weeks wrestling with this, but I really stuck the line of not having special cases. We did not want to install third-party repositories onto these Linux distributions, only to have them fit raw or go out of, out of, out of maintenance for us. Uh, recommendations for you guys, if you do start using this, there are testing tools, so you can, you can integrate this with continuous integration. So there's one called Kitchen Salt that allows you to test your salt states. So you can actually write states. It'll spin up in multiple environments across multiple uh, OSs and actually run your states against each of them to see if they would fail in any way. Uh, so running that kind of continuous integration every time you make a change, that gets you that confidence level to make sure that rollbacks are possible. And then I've got some examples of using Bado 3. Uh, in my GitHub, or our company's GitHub, we're doing uh, like creating our own log tools using Bado3 uh, for tracing, doing things like tracing through logs for requests. Uh, are we living the dream? I would say absolutely living the dream because I got to use FreeBSD in the cloud natively and it saved my life uh, because I was able to use BSD in a very happy fashion. I do want to thank you all for uh, sticking with me. Uh, I'm only like eight minutes over, so sorry. Forgive me, but if you have any no, questions, you're actually early. Am I? Well, it says you finish at twelve fifteen. Oh, it does. Okay. Well, then I got time for I got like seven minutes for questions. You guys are lucky. Yeah. How did that came off? Like, okay, let's do this. How did that whole thing start? I think the whole thing started kind of looking back at those rules of like DevOps Hub. How can I make sure that we don't log into servers? The things are repeatable. We can roll back, and uh, that I can get a consistent environment every time I do a release. So we, I mean, as, as people who are working on a lot of these, these deployments from an infrastructure standpoint, it's really only about two people, one or two people, who are handling the infrastructure pieces for these various projects. So I like the fact that it doesn't require a lot of overhead. There's not a lot of maintenance to it. I mean, to kind of set it, forget it, because if something goes wrong, we can just tear down a server and replace it in a moment's notice with a new server running on the same code. Uh, typically, nothing goes wrong because no one's logging into the servers to make yeah. them into unique snowflakes. Uh, you know, knock on wood, right? Uh, but I think it's just thinking about how to make things repeatable. Uh, we run into this problem a lot as developers. How do I get a new developer who just joined the team spun up quickly to be productive? And so it's a lot about making things reproducible even at the desktop level. Uh, like we'll use SaltStack or Vagrant to even get like VMs locally. Uh, a lot of our infrastructure pieces here, we have local Vagrant files that will spin up a mini cluster on your laptop so I can test things out before I push it into the dev environment or production environment. How do you deal when, when you have to update the, the orchestrating part? When you have to, to do big change to the infrastructure at the higher level, how do you deal to it? Because it's, it seems to me if, if, you, if you want to change maybe the, 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 the connection, how, how it's all wired up. Oh, the infrastructure the, part? The infrastructure part. Because it's, I, I see how it's easy to, to, to uh, orchestrate the deployment to yeah. the release, but for the infrastructure, maybe you, you have like snowflakes for the infrastructure because you have the test so, and the... So we're, we're, that is probably the reason why we're switching to Terraform for a lot of the infrastructure pieces. If you aren't familiar with Terraform, it, you produce a model of how you want the end result to look like, and it calculates the differences from where it's at now. And so with salt stack, you have to more declaratively say, I want to change this infrastructure from that to that infrastructure. Terraform will figure that part out for you. 
and can make that change. You know, obviously you want to approve the apply before you know. Look at what the diff is going to be because you may you may destroy things along the way inadvertently. Uh, but Terraform is probably more powerful when it comes to doing exactly that. Okay. And how how does the uh, integrate? Are are there really uh, something that you're switching completely? No, not necessarily. Uh, Salt, Salt Stack has a Terraform module built into it, so we can actually execute Terraform uh, models against your environment. So that you can actually do that, that uh, integration. Another piece where you probably use the same company who does Terraform, who does Vagrant, uh, you're probably sensing a theme here that I like to have short folks. They also make a tool called Packer for creating images. So, and the Packer supports using Salt states to build the images. So our same salt states that built these infrastructure kind of live can be the same salt states that produce images that we can deploy instantly. Um, as you're probably involved with the salt state development, you probably know that we have an inside situation with my I notify. With which one? With I notify. Yes. Uh, because of beacons and et cetera. So are there any plans in, in salt state community and salt state development to support uh, AQ? Probably. That, that I don't know. Okay. I don't have a good answer on that. Okay. 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 Yes. Um, does salt does a salt master have a? You, you said you could you can get it to a stable tasks. Yes. Does you it, can. Are you is that just a loop? Or are you just uh, like running salt for jobs or? No. Salt so master? salt has its own internal scheduler. Okay. So for example, like the database backups to having it run at certain times, you can schedule kind of like at jobs, like one off do this thing at a certain time, or you can say schedule on a certain schedule, either periodically at this specific time, or every X number of you know, hours, minutes, run a certain uh, internal schedule. So I like doing that over cron jobs, because now everything is kind of centralized around salt stack. Uh, I'm not having salt stack install cron jobs on the remote machines. I'll have salt stack actually automate those tasks and run them on the various minions for me. Because at that point, I get feedback from a centralized spot. If I actually want to to take the output of every one of those cron jobs or tasks and dump them into Elastic. I can now query across them or get notifications or get graphs of the frequency of the runs and also frequency of errors. So instead of relying on you know, cron emails in my inbox to say something went wrong, I can actually have a auto fully automated like, feedback loop that monitors the tasks actually running okay. and can alert. Oh, yeah. That's great. So feedback you get from this one version, and then you can export to Elasticsearch or? You can. So it has, uh, well, so there's plenty of support inside of Salt for many different outputters, like where you want to send the output of the commands, like whether it goes into a database. Natively, you just get like a JSON like dump or a plain text output. And you can get it a JSON or a CSV, or if you have an application you want to stuff it into, like Elastic, or if you want to put it on Kibana, if you guys are using, or not Kibana, but um, Kafka. Like if you've got a, a messaging service, you know, enterprise-wide, and other things are listening for that type of information and consuming it, you can actually have it dump onto your uh, contact for you. Cool. Thank you all.